Our next speaker joining us is uh, Mr. Ashish Karamchandani, who's Executive Director, Monitor Deloitte India, and he specializes in low-income housing. It's great to be speaking with you, sir. Thanks for taking out the time. Now, when one speaks of affordable housing in a city like Mumbai, it just doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But I know that you've been involved in projects which actually look at uh, low-income housing. Take us through your experience and whether this is really feasible in Mumbai. Sure. Happy to talk about that. And I guess the bottom line is not me talking about it, but actual data from the ground. So the last study we did, which was looking at housing coming online in the city of Mumbai and its environs between June of 2011 and January 2013, we actually came across 29 projects with housing being sold at less than 10 lakhs. And as far as we're concerned, a person who's earning 10 to 25,000 rupees a month can afford a house in the 4 to 10 lakh range. So something in 10 lakhs is definitely affordable for low-income housing. Mm -hmm. And that's the area we're interested in. Well, the question is that, you know, whether builders would find this an interesting proposition and where would these houses be and how does the model really work? Okay. So let me go into two parts. First of all, yes, builders are finding it interesting because mm -hmm. when we did this study, we talked to 27 developers across the country. And two-thirds of those developers were on their second and third project. And believe me, no developer does a second project or a third project if they didn't make enough money on the first project. Mm. So builders are definitely making money. On the flip side, is it taking off in a big way? Are there thousands and thousands of developers? The answer is no. So let's decompose that problem. So if you look at fundamental issues like land prices, cost of construction, it is possible to construct housing in the outer suburbs of cities like Bombay, near transport links. Because end of the day, these people need to get to work. Secondly, they need private so schools. So which are these zones, for, let's say for the sake of example, for Mumbai itself, where there is a lot of activity now so going Panvel, on? So Panvel, for example, is one area where there is zone going. Boisar is another area where there is housing going on. Some of the housing there cannot serve the south end of Bombay. But that's not Bombay. Bombay is all over the place. So there are people living in Thane. They also need housing. So some of the housing coming up is actually serving these suburbs of Bombay where there is more and more activity and low-income household. When I say activity, I mean economic activity. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about this, this is all being enabled by housing finance. So end of the day, as I said, land is available, although not in large volumes, and I'll come back to that problem, but the cost of land is not too high. Construction costs are reasonable. At that, you can actually sell housing at 1,800 to 2,000 rupees a square foot, 2,200 rupees a square foot. And then with a small 300 square foot house, you can actually get something sub 10 lakhs. Now, the big thing to actually make this work is financing. Even if there is a house at 10 lakhs, if you can't get financing, what do you do? What's interesting is over the last six years, as we've been working in this field, we've actually been able to get a bunch of housing finance companies started that really finance informal sector customers. And today, there are 10 of them. In fact, they've given out 1,000 crores in loans, and their defaults are literally zero. Mm. So from the customer side, there's no issue. Housing finance is flowing. But the challenge is to really get this to scale up one needs more and more land. And the other big problem is the approval times. This business of low-income housing is a manufacturing volume business. You need lots and lots of it to actually make your money. You don't make your money on each house. Mm. Now, to get that going, if you start on a project, if you take a very long time to get that project up and going, in the meantime, your land price has skyrocketed. So you can no longer afford to do low-income projects if approval times are long. So the big issue here is, and the big opportunity also here is, for government to get more actively involved. And the good thing is it's happening both at the central level and at the state level. Sure. So the central government has laid out a set of guidelines on how to facilitate low-income housing, including basically how to speed up the approval process. And at the state level, places like Rajasthan, Orisha are actually showing examples of where they're giving free FSI as incentive to developers to construct more low-income housing. And then you have Ahmedabad, which has done something interesting. It's actually zoned areas around the ring road, which is basically where there's good transport links only for low-income housing. Mm -hmm. Now, these things have yet to be played out. A lot of them are early days. Mm -hmm. But we see good signs where A, fundamentally the economics work, so the housing is possible. B, housing finance is flowing. And now government is coming in. And of course, the core of all this is the customer. People are desperate to buy their own housing. That's exactly what I was coming to, that is this purely an end user market or uh, does one fear that perhaps there'll be an element of speculation and some kind of commercial aspirations which will come into this? Uh, well, the interesting thing is, yeah, well. the interesting thing is there's 
always, whenever you're playing with the private sector, you cannot control it. If a developer is selling a housing, anybody can buy it, an mm -hmm. end customer or investor. Now, we've actually done st studies of people who have actually built these kinds of housing. So part of our work is to see, is this really working? Are the right people getting into this kind of housing? Or otherwise so, the sub-10 starts becoming 20 and 20 goes And more to than that, you have the guy buying the sub-10, flipping it, you know, that's yes, not our exactly. objective. Yeah. So we've actually done some interesting studies to see what's going on. And first of all, because these projects are quite far out, they don't get occupancy immediately. So it does take time for occupancy to go up. But what's fascinating is in the projects we've actually studied, the occupants are all earning less than 20,000 a month. And it's true, those are the ones who are most desperate, so they go out first. What's fascinating is about 60% of them are owners, 40% of them are renters. So it's actually creating rental stock. So if you think of an end goal, even though a slightly higher income person may have bought it, he's renting it out to the right income group. So we're actually quite optimistic about the impact that this is creating. So you would expect perhaps stable pricing in this market to sustain for, for some time? No. With anything like this where there's a huge demand and there's not enough supply, prices are going to go up. So I think what we need is to enable more supply to actually keep prices stable. And that's where government comes in. Okay. So different things to facilitate more land, also improve the affordability for customers. Right now, the housing finance companies are borrowing money from the market at pretty high interest rates. If government could get them lower cost funds, the rates at which they lend out the money would be lower. Mm -hmm. Also, government in other ways can actually play a facilitative role, like I told you, you know, actually improving approval times. That's one of the biggest drivers of cost in this business. Sure. Sure. On a final note, I mean, uh, one is also, of course, awaiting clarity on this national housing regulator of sorts. Uh, what is it that you'd like this body to incorporate, to do, to look at the overall problem of housing for middle to low middle income groups? I think at some level, the regulator has to be effective. And part of the being effective is make sure all the permits, etc., everything else is in place. So at the end of the day, the person buying a house is secure. They're getting a legal house. Second, if they can just make sure there's some transparency, so what's the square footage, what's the actual pricing, that would be extremely useful. And thirdly, if there's some form of redressal, so if there's a problem somebody can approach them, that would be phenomenally useful. Okay, plenty of ideas to think about. Thank you so no much. No lack of ideas. The question is getting out and doing it now. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Welcome.